just a minute. Remain standing and reach your hands up and just stretch real, real, real good. Come on, release some energy. Lean to the left and lean to the right and turn around and shake the little. Don't want to get anything to get clogged up there. That was that was amazing. Thank you. Amazing. She and I were together at, uh, with Aretha Franklin at the Radio City Music Hall the night before uh, Whitney Houston's memorial service, which we were all going the next day, but Aretha didn't feel well. And um, so we went then to, to, um, the, to the All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. And it was packed that morning, the Unitarian Church there. Madge sang that song, and the whole crowd just, everybody started sobbing. It was just we felt that the trauma, not that Whitney died, but how she died and maybe even why. Um, the song seems appropriate because we're at that place when not a lot makes sense. You ever been there? Sometimes you're not supposed to figure out, just figure in to whatever it is. The nations are grieving today, not because people died in Paris or Beirut or the south side of Chicago, or the west side of Tulsa. It's why they died and how they died. Or not so much that they died, but that they were killed. Or why somebody killed them. Death itself is beautiful, powerful. It's one of the assets of life and aspects of life and living. But when somebody is killed or when they die tragically, perhaps with a dread illness, that takes them and their families through a horrendous experience. Those are the types when we, and times when we just get really confused or conflicted and we love and we hurt and we dance around what all that is. And that's a human process and it's okay. Turn to somebody and say, it's okay. But we don't know what okay means either. (laughs) Because we're just here. So I want to talk a little bit... um, and we were going to have the imam come in who was at the services a few moments ago with um, Pastor Marlon. Um, we are a friendly church and a loving church and a loving community. And we reach out to embrace all the various expressions of life and of living and of faith. And we're not apologetic in the sense that we feel sorry for something. We are embracing all that is and allowing it to explain itself in time. Yeah, yeah. To explain means to make plain. But if it's always plain, then you're flatlined. So you got to have the ups and downs. So if it's always like this, that generally means you dead. So as long as it's doing this, you're alive. Everybody do this for a minute. Just, there's energy in that. Now do it with the other hand. Now do it with both hands. And that's like saying goodbye to something. <laughs> so all of that's healthy and all of that can be healing. Um, I want to talk, since this is the Thanksgiving month, I chose uh, to talk about grief and gratitude. And it's hard to talk about gratitude without talking about grief. Why do we even need to be grateful? I mean, I've actually added it and paraphrased it, satitude and gratitude. Uh, which is the most prominent? Give me a reason why you're sad or not sad. If, I, if this was a seminar or a workshop, we were going to have time as I walk around and say, give me a one or two reasons why you're sad for whatever reason. And, and give me some reasons why you're glad. And do both those energies operate simultaneously and with equity in your life all the time? And if they do, have you become so used to it that you know how to navigate between the two and choose which one will be dominant at any particular time? It was a little weighty in here because of the somberness of the the service and what we're thinking. That's what grief means, weighty. It's heavy. It's grave, like the grave. Grief and grave. There are times for that. We don't know how to completely avoid it. It just happens. How do we handle grief? Sometimes we handle satitude with gratitude, with an attitude of gratitude. 
or gratitude or thankful. I'm saying thankful uh, in refusing to be angry about something. If we're angry, why are we angry? What angers us or saddens us or hurts us? If I said to you, write down three things you're glad about, could you do that? And could you be honest with it? Yeah. How long would it take you to think of it? Some of you say, I'm glad that this service is over in only 15 minutes. Okay, we'll write that down. <laughs> I'm glad that I have somebody to hang out with for lunch afterward or I'm going to eat something that I enjoy. I'm glad that I live in Tulsa. I'm glad that I'm enjoying this sort of somber day with the not real bright light, but there is still light. Even at night when the moon shines, the night light has its purpose. It's not supposed to be as bright as night, at night as it is in the daytime, or night wouldn't be night. So you can't complain at the moon because it's not as bright as the sun. It's called the night light. Some of you who don't sleep well have to need to turn every light out in the house. Everything out. Because there's energy in light that can stimulate you and cause or do endorphins to begin to act. And you might even laugh. Or you, some, I like a, a pitch black room when I'm sleeping. And I like to sleep. I like my bedroom always to be on the east so that I can crack the window. Because if I don't, when that sun comes in, I want to get up. If it doesn't come in, I can sleep long. I wish I could sleep longer than six hours. I rarely do. Some people, like Natalie, can sleep. My daughter, a teenager, can sleep 27,000 hours. <laughs> what a gift that is if you can just sleep on and on and on. I've never been able to sleep on and on and on and on. That's a gift. But there was a time to be awake, but I decided no longer to complain about the night line, which we call the moon. I'm going to read a passage of scripture, which is one of my favorite scriptures and one of my least favorite scriptures in the Bible. It's 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians from the church of, written to the church of Thessalonica. 518, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I've always interpreted that to mean for everything give thanks. For this is the will. What is the will? Giving thanks or everything. In everything, not for, in every situation, give thanks. Amen. Or be have an attitude of gratitude, even if the gratitude isn't always. You can be, gra you can be grateful without being glad. Amen. Do you know the difference? I'll have to tell you what it is. You can decide it for yourself. In everything, give thanks for this is, and I'm, I'm not interpreting that to mean everything. I mean, for that, that, um, that it's the will of God for me to give thanks, but it's the will of some ultimate reality we call God that everything that occurs, occurs because it has a purpose for it. Yes. That way I won't complain. It's easier for me to be grateful for everything that happens if I believe that everything that happens has a purpose that is ultimately beneficial. Talk to me, somebody. The late Viktor Frankl, Holocaust survivor, psychiatrist, died in Germany at the age 91 or something like that, wrote a book called Search for Significance, said, to live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning or significance or a sign or signature or design, assignment for the suffering. The signature or significance, the sign or signal or the assignment or designment of the issue has a purpose for my best being. Wow. And I refuse to complain about something I don't like. Amen. Or even somebody I don't like. What's happening in, in Beirut and what's happening in Paris and different parts of the Middle East and what's happening down the street and maybe in this room. Is there something in your life that is occurring that you don't like? Yes. <laughs> well, at least you agreed with me. There is something that's not only happening in your life, there's something that is your life or something about you that you basically do not like and have never liked and I'm not sure you ever will like, but it's because you don't know why it's there. Amen. All of us go through these um, appendix things, appendicitis. Nobody knows what the, what is this, is that what's called? The, the, nobody knows why the appendix is there. 
And, and when it gets inflamed, when it gets, of course, they remove it quickly. But there are a lot of appendix to life. Add-ons. <laughs> Cling-ons. <laughs> that we wish would get the heaven away. <laughs> we wish they were not there, but they are. Now, if you know why that pain is there, how it came, it's a little bit easy to manage. We all deal with pain, but it's just why and where did it come from? At least we can have a conversation. I don't want strange pain in my life. Talk to me, somebody. If I know why it's there and that it's there, I can kind of deal with it and manipulate with it. I don't need to just want to quickly run and take a painkiller and kill it because sometimes the pain there is indication to you that something's out of kelter, out of sync, out of cadence, and then there is decadence. <laughs> Death. You start going backwards. So study the pain when something dies, whether it is a business or person or a relationship, do an autopsy. Auto yourself. An authentic self-study of why the thing died. Amen. Amen. Even if pain certainly goes away. Ask yourself why. Where did it go? What? Did I have anything to do? What, did I change my attitude? Did I change my diet? Did I change the position? And we're doing it all during this service. You keep changing positions because you're trying to feel comfortable about you. You change the, the circulation in one leg, blocks off when you cross it so long, so you change the other. You pull an earlobe, you scratch your nose, you, you do stuff. <laughs> because you want to be both comfortable and comforted. And everything, give thanks. Grief, and I'm saying from grief to gratitude, grief basically comes from a French word that means burden, to be weighty or heavy or weighted down. It's very grave. It's burdy, burdened or buried in a grave. It's a grave situation. So grief and grave, which we normally bury people in the grave, six feet under six is the biblical number for man or for flesh because on the sixth day, according to the Hebrew Bible, man was created uh, in that scenario, that whole narrative, which is an allegory. But six and sex, six and sex, the day when life began to recreate or procreate itself through other flesh, it's a grave situation. Why is life for so many people little less than a sexually transmitted disease? It's a grave thing because when you say life, you think of the opposite of that, which would be what? Yeah. Death. So life is a form of death or a form of dying. And the only way you can die is to be alive. Amen. You can't die without living. That's good. That's good. And according to what they tell us, you can't live without dying. So there's a subtle, um, subliminal anger or anxiety, if you will, sadness, about living. So to have a special time of Thanksgiving, that's not the only time to be Thanksgiving, but it reminds us that we should shift the attitude to gratitude and gratitude and find something in our life to be happy with because there's this underlying fear of dying, a relationship that dies, a bo your body dies, a job, you might lose something. There's this crazy suspicion, even of God. I'm thinking the longer I live, the people are not that happy about God. The reason a lot of people don't want to believe in God is because they don't like the one they believe in. <laughs> you don't really have to be an atheist if you don't believe in nothing. I mean, I don't have to stop believing in a God if I don't. The, the, the God we don't believe in is the one we believe we don't like. Come on, let's squirm a little bit this morning. I can understand if you say I'm agnostic, I don't know. Because we don't. But if I say I don't believe in God, I'm saying I don't believe in the God that y'all tell me to believe in. I don't believe in that one either. Or at least I don't like him if I do believe in him. He happens to be him, you know. Now it's just say, very suddenly you say, I don't believe in her. Or them. Or it. In one sense, we're saying, I don't like my life as it's supposed to have been created for me. Can I recreate or find some recreation in my life? We're here trying to get some therapy to recreate or procreate something in our lives that we feel is missing and we want it to come back. We're always greeting about something. Yes, yes. Come on now. 
We eat things we like. We don't just eat. If you just, if you just took nutrition's, nutrition, I mean, they could intravenously give that to you, or you could take it through pills or shakes. But I like to taste my food. Talk to me, please. Just because it, it's good for you, that doesn't mean it has to taste like cardboard. Usually, if it really tastes good, it's not good for you. How many of you know what that's like? They give you some putrid stuff, and it's really good for you. Well, I don't just want to live. I'd like to really. I love the scripture, the passage where the scripture says that Jesus says, I am come that you might have life. Well, who doesn't have life? And we had it before he came. I like the part that the addition, the appendix, and that you might have it more. Come on, help me. You might. I want abundant, which means abounding life. Bountiful, full, fully expressed and complete life that I enjoy. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, are you having fun? <laughs> or are you just funny? <laughs> I wish we had time to go through the room and, and let me hear you tell me what you think is fun. Not what you think is funny. <laughs> or maybe both. When do we have fun? Am I having fun now? A certain amount of me. I just got in from Orlando last night. I was with Panache Desai. You may have seen him on Super Sunday with Oprah many times. A young, a young East Indian guy. Had, had uh, several hundred people there. And, and this guy calls him, he calls me his Metacostal father. <laughs> he speaks in tongues and prays for the sick and all that stuff. And he doesn't do it in the name of Jesus. So I said, what you doing, boy? So we have a... <laughs> We become fast friends. They had them all over the floor. He calls them slam downs. We used to call them being slain in the spirit. So there's all these people laying on the floor, and some of them were jerking and quickening, and some of them were speaking in tongues. I said, wait just a minute here. Uh, so we're having an interesting conversation about these various transcendent, sometimes physical or emotional experiences that people have, whether it's in the name of religion or not. People that get high on drugs, Eventually, I would imagine that marijuana will be legal all across the country. Uh, just like same-sex marriage is legal and a, a woman's right to choose is legal and things that many religious people fight against, uh, somehow they get legal. Now, what do you do with what is legal or what is considered legitimate in your life or illegal? How do you handle what you don't believe? Are you legally married? You know, we, we ministers can, can, can administer uh, the sacred ceremony of the betrothal of marriage, but you're not really married until the judge, <laughs> to the judge say you're married. I mean, you're not legally married. I mean, we can have all the vestments and all the beauty and all the pageantry and all the ceremony, but you're not legally married until the man downtown who may not pray says you are, or the woman down there who may not believe in your God. Isn't that interesting? Talk about separation of church and state. That's a pure, pure example of it. How many people are happily married or just happily married? Did you get three hands went up? You're happily married. Now, in each case, only one of the members put up the hand. <laughs> Both of y'all ain't happy. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes we're ashamed to say, well, I see two families that's lying back there. Well, there, three hands are up. That's good. It's a situation, and you're not always happy with anything, including yourself. And I always say, if, 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 if two people have the same opinion about everything all the time, one of them ain't necessary. <laughs> so do like this for a minute. We're just about finished. You're shifting the energy around about what you think. Am I glad or am I sad? Is this a grave situation? Life is a dying experience that ends in a grave. This single reality or perception produces an underlying tension in the psyche of humanity or, or of humankind. And therefore, gratefulness or gratitude or thanksgiving is encouraging, it is encouraging as an encouragement, is a rare and contrived discipline. You have to almost make yourself say, I'm glad because you're so congenitally sad and don't even know it. Where did that sadness come from? It's, of course, it comes from our perceptions about life and about death and about existence and about expansion and about growth and about holding on to things, achieving things, maintaining, gaining, uh, getting something, holding something, whether that's age, 
And only when you get a certain place, you start noticing that you're aging. You see a few more wrinkles and grays and feel a little stiffness in the knee, a little in the back. And she says, I, I believe that you should respect your elders, but I'm having more trouble finding them these days. <laughs> that, is, that is the weirdest experience. I can't, I'm so glad to find somebody older than me anymore. This is the most dramatic transition in my, all my life is this, I'm moving into, I mean, I was very resistant when I first got an AAR, a, um, thank you, AARP, I didn't open them for years. I rarely open them now. And I'm missing benefits because my ego doesn't want to accept the fact that I'm old <laughs> or I'm considered a senior citizen. And there are all kinds of benefits. I can get cheaper uh, movie tickets. I'm going to see Spectre tonight. I can... I can, uh, I, I, I can get a whole bunch of senior stuff. Mother White, right? Uh, she's old. Uh, she can tell me. <laughs> she take all, she, I need to find out what, what you get from all this stuff. There's all kinds of benefits if I accept the fact that I'm graciously aging. Yes. What's all that? Yes, yeah, stuff. <laughs> I'm graciously evolving and expanding into the next reality. I am glad I'm who I am. I'm grateful of who I am. So my attitude is becoming gratitude and not satitude for all things. And in all things, you really mature when you can say I'm grateful for that everything really does have a significant sponsorship. It has spawned in your life. Look at me when I tell you, you're okay. You already know that. I'm just reminding you. Sometimes you forget that you're okay because you don't believe you're okay. But you're all right. You've been through hell and back. Did you often hear me say shift happens? S-H-I-F-T. My shift happens. My shift happens. Holy shift. I mean, I sanctify it and make it holy. I've been. <laughs> Somebody said to the kid, oh, he did me. Spell it to him, baby. She says, S-H-I-F-T. <laughs> Say, my shift is holy. Say it, please. My shift is holy. And I'm getting my shift together. Say it. <laughs> Tell somebody to turn to them and say, get your shift together. <laughs> Stop complaining about it. Stop protesting and contesting and resenting and resisting it. Just get in the flow. People live, people die, people live until they die. And then we all like to believe we live again in some reality, some pre-existent or post-existent consciousness that is unending. Wrap your arms around yourself, as I love to have you do. Thanks and giving are two powerful virtues in the human experience that expand our connectedness in ways that no other two experiences do. Thanks and giving. There were about 58 pilgrims and something like 90 Indians or Native Americans at the original Thanksgiving meal. The natives, other than having portions of their land invaded and it wasn't dramatic at that time, didn't have the same appreciation as the pilgrims who had come across the stormy seas and left everything in England to come here. But somehow they were welcomed by the natives. There was some disaster between then and now, as you well know. But initially, they learned the process, the best thing to do with an enemy is make him a friend. And forgiveness, as you've heard me say, is giving up the right to be right. Not always the reason. It's giving up the right to be angry, not the reason to be angry, because we have plenty. Not the reason to be hurt, but the right to be hurt. The right to be angry and the right to consider yourself right. That's a freeing thing. Take those same arms and release something. Get them up in the air, please, everyone, and just kind of let some things go. Shake, tension, stress, anxiety, satitude, let it go. Let the satitude go. Don't be grave and don't be grief. 
We're going to walk through those doors in a couple minutes, and I want you to, to do something that you know is fun. Okay, don't just go back home and flop down, unless that's the funniest thing you know how to do. <laughs> and it might be. If this is one of those afternoons you could go sleep. If you're lonely, embrace the loneliness and make it a friend. If you wish you'd be with somebody, just wish you could be with you. Would somebody want to be with you since you're in such a somber mood? I'm all by myself. Nobody want to be with you. So change your attitude. No, change your attitude about you and then you'll enjoy being with you. I was single for 40 years. I used to feel sorry for myself at times. Then I thought, if I'm going to sit around here and be sorry for me, don't nobody want to be with me. So I changed my attitude about me and I, I got along with me better. See, so know there's it's not just loneliness, it is aloneness. And we all have it. Amen. And we should maintain it as a sacred compartment of our soul. Yes. The aloneness. If you know how to be alone, you can deal with loneliness with expertise. Thank you, intelligent holiness wholeness, completion, and mature way of thinking and being. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this building. For that positive energy that we call Holy Spirit. For that invigorating vitality. For that wonderful mystical ambiance and nuance of self and soul that heals and restores and initiates and reinvigorates. We thank you today that all is well because we say it is well. And we see it as well. We don't make it happen. We see it happen too. And what we see is what we get. So we see it all good and all God. In the name and nature of all that is good and all is God. And so it is. Everybody say it. So it is. Thank you, God. Give that God next to you a high five. There's one sitting next to you. A divinity sitting next to you. All right, brethren. You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work till we're done. Thanks for tuning in online. We are so pleased with all the different people who have been tuning in from all over the country and all over the world. If you have a chance to send me an email or connect with me in some way, let me know what you're finding, why you tune in, and what you're getting out of it. I would love to hear from you. And if you get a chance to make a gift to support this ministry, to become a partner, we would love to partner with you and have you be a friend of the church and somebody who is actually supporting us to create this congregation and the world that we're trying to create together. You can be a part of it, and every gift of every amount makes a difference. We really appreciate your support.